So if y'all would turn in your Bibles, we'll be moving steadily through the book of Genesis today, but turn to, to Genesis 8 is where we'll start. We'll have some stuff on the, some slides up before that, but we're really going to get started as far as our reading and following in 8. But last week, we began by laying the groundwork for our study of tree imagery, and I know if I say that, because I was talking to a couple prior to last Sunday, they were like, where, where are we going next? I said, I think we're doing some tree imagery. And I got that look that, as they say back home, as a calf staring at a new gate, just kind of, what? And I know it, it, it's like the book of Numbers, that doesn't sound exciting, but when you understand what it's about, and, and it's taught the way it's supposed to be, then it is very exciting. So last week, as we started um, laying the groundwork and priming the pump for this, um, it might have been a little bland, and, but it was necessary. And even today, you might feel like we'll, we'll pick up some speed today because we'll be doing some narrative. But at the same time, you're probably going to feel like you've been, you're drinking out of a fire hose. There's a lot here. That's fine. Uh, as long as you get the gist of it. That's You can pick that up and, and move on in your own study with that. So, we're also going to link to some previous lessons on other types of Im imagery uh, where it applies. Because once again, I want you to understand, this is a tapestry. These are threads that are being woven and they are interwoven. And they layers to the onion that build on each other. That So, it, you're meant to... As you read the Bible, which once again is Jewish meditation literature, I think sometimes we forget that it's ancient because we've got access to all these modern translations. But you've got to understand, this is ancient literature. Most of the time we're reading it from a, a translation, and we're a world away, thousands of years away. But if you start at the beginning of the, of the Bible in Genesis 1-1, the way you're meant to do that is, is as you go, you're building your theology. And that builds, it crescendos all the way into the New Testament to, to Jesus and then even the, the New Jerusalem that comes down. So it, it's made to, to layer, to layer, to layer. And you're meant to see the hyperlinks or the, the similarities in the phrases. Those of you that have been here a while understand that. So some of those hyperlinks and some of those things are more obvious at times than others. But in order to appreciate all this, we have to make sure that we also have to make sure that we get into the heads of the immediate culture and the characters of the ancient Near East. And so we might not be accustomed in America to the imagery of Eden or Edenic imagery or temple imagery or mountain imagery or how that relates to cosmological imagery. And, and, and that's all in their world that innately is planted in their minds so that when they see this, it really makes sense. We have to work at it. All right, so their understanding and appreciation of these things is akin to our appreciation of computers and cars and television or science or what have you. With those things just innately weave, it, weave themselves into our conversations, uh, into what we read, what we see. And so it comes very naturally to us. And so if we were writing something here today, uh, say we were writing the Bible today and, and just God commissioned somebody in here to do it. And then a thousand, two thousand years from now, you know, Captain Kirk is, is reading this, what we wrote, then he's going to have to do some work to get there. I mean, um, just think of it this way. I can use a laptop and I can get around the internet. If it doesn't work, I'm lost. All right? So I can get the basics, but I'm not, the, I'm not an expert on it. Um, I can fix your car. Don't call me, I ain't got time. But I can fix your car. But most, most people in here can drive one. So you can use it. And you can get the basics out of it. But if it doesn't crank, most people are lost. Alright? So think of it like that. That's what we're doing here, is trying to bring all this stuff to the force so it makes sense um, to, to, to us the way it made sense to them. And so when I say tree imagery... You got people that go, I don't think that's a stretch. To us, it would be. But to someone in a mostly non-literate culture where symbolism and iconography and all that is a big deal, then it's not a stretch at all. And so they're accustomed to linking those things. And so 
we move in the world of cars and computers and all that, and we've ascribed different meanings to these things, whether they're literal or symbolic or metaphorical or whatnot. So therefore, in our everyday communication, we incorporate and we appropriate various images and expressions in our conversations, what we read once again. And so they were no different. So in order to know what's trying to be said, because God's communicating through them in His written Word, they have to understand it. All right? They have to know. And you've got human authors. God is the ultimate author, but He's not zapping anybody in their remote writing or anything. It doesn't work that way. That's why each book reads a little bit differently. Same subject matter, what have you, but the author is different. I used the example yesterday, <coughs> the men's prayer breakfast, <coughs> that if God had commissioned the Bible to be written now, and he tasked Rodney with writing the book of Rodney, well, Rodney's an IT guy. You're going to be able to figure that out in reading stuff, because he'll say something like, and God was speaking to so, so and so and downloaded it into their brain, you know. And then Sam was there, and Sam's in the medical industry, so if you read the book of Sam, you're going to have medical terminology interwoven into that. And so you got Jesus, when he's talking to fishermen, he uses imagery and, and the, the vernacular of fishermen. If he's talking to farmers, the same thing. That's the way it works. If we're not accustomed to that, then we can easily miss something. So please keep in mind, I said all that, start saying this. Please keep in mind that we talked last week about how the idea of a tree of life was not something particular to the Israelites. I know that's a shock to some people, but it's not. Most of those ancient cultures, if not all, in the ancient Near East had a tree of life somewhere in their worldview. And so everybody in that, in that area was familiar with this and what it meant. The difference is, that it, in the idea of a tree of life, was that the surrounding nations looked at the tree as a god or a manifestation of a god, little g, god. Whereas in the Bible, the tree is not a god. It is a gift and a creation from the one true creator, God. And that's what we call polemical. All right? That means we're using the same terminology as everybody else, but we're showing you how and where you've gotten it wrong. And that's what they're doing. They're deconstructing the argument of the pagan nations and building it back up with the truth. So, uh, there's, that's a substantial difference. And so... It was a different take that was meant to point toward, once again, God. They already recognized the vocabulary, but it's, it's defined differently. Okay. We also looked at the Hebrew word, eights. We spell it in English, a transliteration, E-T-Z, but it's pronounced eights, like A-I-T-Z or something like that. And remember, Hebrew is flexible, as most languages are, and that can mean wood, tree, Shrub, bush, vine, blah, blah, blah. Anything along those lines can be attributed to an orchard or a garden where all these plants can exist. And the idea, once again, of a garden was attributed to divinity and royalty. That's why you have a garden of Eden. That is the abode of Yahweh on this planet. And he deals with Adam and Eve in that, and that's good. And then they are supposed to go outside of that garden and make the rest of the planet like the Garden uh, of Eden so that it's all the abode of God in that sense. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the mission. That's the dominion mandate that's supposed to happen. Trees uh, were seen as something that's an arid place. So if you have, you've all heard of an oasis. There's a song, Midnight at the Oasis. Uh, there's my Tourette's kicking out. Um, so you, 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 your idea of an oasis in the desert. Why do you have an oasis? Because you have water. Where does water come from? It comes from God. And then you have life springing from that. So you get the idea of, I will give you rivers of living water. And you are like a tree planted beside the waters or the rivers. All of that's Edenic imagery we're meant to see. But it all means it comes from God. And those are things you get by uh, faith in God. So any sort of thing like that is seen as, as representative of provision and sustenance from on high. And these were things also, generally speaking, available only to the wealthy 
or to royalty on earth. And remember, there's no middle class. You got the top few percent, and everybody else is dirt poor. Po, P-O, poor. All right? Can't even pay attention, they're so poor. All right, and then building off of, of what we talked about last week, you had two specific trees. We all know of those, the tree of knowledge and the tree of good, the, excuse me, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the tree of tov and ra, tov being good, ra being evil. All right, and we talked about how trees, we now we start to likening the imagery between trees and humans, is that trees can, in a sense, live forever if the conditions are right because they have seed. They fall out of the tree and a bunch of other trees grow and it just keeps going. We also talk then about in the Bible how the word seed is also used for people, for lineage and children. And we'll see something about that here today in that in, in their world, even if you passed away or when you passed away, you live on through your children. And I don't mean that in a bad way like you see today with all the, never mind, uh, with all that, as, as, your, as your lineage and your seed goes and continues to reproduce, you, you were seen to live on through them. Okay? So, so that links tree imagery and humans also. All right, so we need to see how that, that runs through the Bible. Once again, trees, of course, are linked with gardens and mountains. Gardens and mountains are linked to God. That's why you have tall temples. They are man-made mountains. And at the top, that's where you met with God. Where did uh, Moses meet with God? At the top of Sinai. After he had an encounter, an encounter at a burning eights. Okay? That's the way it works. And so anytime you come to big things happen on mountains and big things happen around trees and big things, really big things happen around trees on mountains or high places. All right. And we talked about all that. I don't want to get... Too much, I need to get moving. But all these things had a fixed imagery in their world. And once again, what may seem like something of a stretch to us would have been much more obvious to them. It was how they communicated, almost a language within itself, which is what we should expect, once again, in a culture where most people were not literate. So the tree of life imagery represented abundant life that came from God or to the pagan world, the little g-gods, but once again, to the Israelites, the tree wasn't divine. Big difference. It was a gift from God. And so the second specific tree in the garden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of Tov and Ra. And humans were in that garden because God wanted them to rule alongside Him. That's what He tells them. Go and have dominion and multiply and be stewards over this thing. That's another thing that would have stood out in the ancient Eastern world because none of the other uh, creation stories want that. The gods want to rule, and we hum humans are created to serve them in the sense, and when I say serve, I mean bring them food so that they can rest. But in our story, in the Bible, we are created and put into paradise, and God feeds us. We don't feed Him. And then He, he wants us to enter into the same rest that he has, which in the pagan accounts is the gods a lot of times just, you know, sleeping, napping, because they don't want to do anything. Our God does it all. You see the differences? They're linked by the vocabulary, but they're different. So when our God invites us to, to rest, none of the other gods say that. The little G gods, okay, y'all got what I'm talking about there. I don't want to have to clarify that every statement. But when we're in, uh, invited to enter into God's rest, <clears throat> and people always ask, was God tired? No, that's not what the word rest means there. That's the English definition. But in their world, that sort of rest was what the king does when he sits on his throne and observes all that he rules. And that's what God did on the seventh day. And he wants us to do that also. Why would he do that? Because we have dominion, that's part of the mandate, and he wants us to rule also with him. That's the way that works. So into all that world, we're plunged. But in order to do that, in order to carry out that mandate, we need wisdom. And so we have a few references here. Or supposed to. There we go. Job 28, 28. 
See if you find a common word in here. He said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that's a one common phrase, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. So I want you to see you've got this wisdom, which we'll see later is linked to life, and the counter to that is to turn away from it, or foolishness, or stupidity, or moronic, or whatever word, modern word you want to use. Psalm 111.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now that's important because you've got a tree in the garden that is the knowledge of good and evil. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Psalm, oh, excuse me, Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We, ought to, we, we know that by now. should know it. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 15.33 The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So what we had at the fall, when Adam and Eve partake, partake of the wrong tree, is something of an attempt to circumvent God on the way to getting knowledge and wisdom. And it's, just, it's in this circumventing that we run into problems. We'll talk a little bit, hopefully, if we get there today. When uh, Abraham and Sarah go to Hagar, in what in their world was legal, and we think, ooh, that's nasty, but in their world is a legal surrogacy where she takes a handmaid and gives, it, gives her to Abraham so she can bear a child because she can't have a child. God's promised them a child, but now they are way, they're out of Social Security. They're so old. And it's like, there's no way it's going to happen. So they circumvent God's plan and try to figure it out on their own. That's the same, you're meant to see that as a, is something similar to what went on in Eden. And so we have that, that circumvention of God's wisdom. Had Adam and Eve stuck with the plan, they would have had wisdom from God that they would have obtained through their obedience. They attempted, it to, they attempted to get it another way. And in doing this, they were exposed to death and lost their innocence, rebelling in the process. So you're meant to see disobedience leads to death. Example, you, most of us have told our children, don't run out into the street. Look both ways before you cross the street. But we all know, at times, they shoot out of the house and they run right out in the street. Now, there are two things going on here. Number one, you have the disobedience, which is the first thing that pops into my head. Boy, I told you. How many times have I told you? You don't run out into the street. But there's more to it than that. Because that disobedience doesn't just lead to death because he disobeyed me. Now he's, you know, something's going to happen. It leads to death because you can get hit by a car. Does that make sense? Because that's the same thing you've got going on in Eden. It's not that they just ate a, a death fruit from a tree. It's not that they just, just that they disobeyed. It's that that they've been exposed to now that has taken their innocence from them. And that in, even in and of itself leads to death. And so if that is true, as we read through the Bible, that is what we should see. So Adam and Eve did what was right in their own eyes and it led to death. Or the, in one sense, the expulsion or the exile or what's later called haram, harem, in, in the Hebrew, uh, is they have to go away from the presence of God. But there's mercy even in that, because now they can't sit, sit there in their death and this knowledge, this loss of innocence, and still partake of the tree of life and live forever in that sin. So even the expulsion has mercy that comes along with it. And from there, because death has now infected everything, from there you get the first murder. With Cain and Abel. So as you see, this all comes on the heels of what they did. So death is now, literal death, is now entering the picture. Lamech then did the same. And then we get to Genesis 6. And I'm not dealing with um, sons of God and daughters of women. There's something else going on there that, that, that normally gets overshadowed. But Genesis 6, 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness, the raw, the word, the raw of man, 
the Ra of Adam actually, was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So that's infected everything. From the disobedience of the tree, coming out of the garden, through Cain and Abel, uh, Cain and Abel, Lamech, and then you've got city being built, and that has all kinds of ramifications. All the way through to now, it's just everywhere. There's just violence everywhere. It's not just the, the whole deal with the sons of God coming out. There's violence everywhere. So here we get a rundown of how the things were going. Once Ra, or evil, entered into the world, it grew like this fungus, this plague. And God had to do something about it. What did He do? Most of us know. He decided to flood the earth in order to cleanse it. How is water used in the Bible? Well, sometimes it's chaos in a pre-creation state. Sometimes it's used to ritually purify things, to wash things clean. And so the water was to purify the earth that had been cursed with the blood of violence. And this then leads to the introduction of this dude named Noah. It leads to God judging the earth and its people, but it's also an act of decreation. Because at the, by the time of the floodwaters that cover the earth, you're right back to where you were in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And in their world, that's decreation, that's chaos, that's disorder. Water covering the deep. You're meant to see that. And so what happens at the end of that? is you get a new creation, all right? So God's judging the earth, and then he, he finds uh, Noah, and therefore he has to start over with another man because it's gotten so bad to take the place and carry on the mission of Adam, and that's where Noah comes into play. Genesis 5, 28, we're going back to in genealogy here, it says, when Lamech li had lived 182 years, he fathered a son, and he called him Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord is cursed. All right, This one shall bring us relief or rest from our work and from all the painful toil of our hands. So Noah, his name, that's what they're telling you there, not so many words, is Noah, his name means rest or relief. All right, And, so, or, and we are told then from what the people were to be relieved. Genesis 6, 5, once again. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention... Of the, not just every thought, but it's in the intent behind the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted the, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals, creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this is similar where this is why you have all of a sudden, we'll get there in a minute, you roll into Genesis 12 after all this crazy stuff, and, and just this random guy is thrown into the narrative. Right here, you got a random guy thrown into the narrative that found favor for whatever reason from God. Noah is a seed. If you go back to what we talked about, the thread of the firstborn, Noah is a seed in the lineage through which God chose to work from Adam, goes all the way down, and eventually he wind up with Jesus. So in this sense, he is another Adam. Adam's long gone. God has just destroyed things. You've got a decreation, and now you're going to have to have a new creation. He's got to start over. In that sense, he's another Adam. What does he do? He lands on a mountain, a high place. Okay. He exits the ark, and we're told that by this time there's trees Eights all around. So in, this is another case, that I'll get into it more in a minute, of Edenic imagery. So in this capacity, as you're reading, back in Genesis 3, we were promised that some guy, a deliverer, was coming to crush the head of the serpent. So as you're reading, you're meant to think, is this the guy? Look at, all, look at the status he has. Look at what he's doing. Look at where he's placed in the story. Could he be the one? You're meant to be thinking that way. Of course, we're looking at this in hindsight, but that's what we're meant to see. So, But we need to ask ourselves, before we start getting all that, how was Noah to relieve us or to give us rest? And once again, rest is related to Sabbath. Does that 
hyperlink? I've already spoiled it for you. Does that hyperlink to anything? Hyperlinks right back to creation. Why? Because you've got a recreation here. We're meant to see that. You've got a do-over. Eden 2.0, as it were. So, we've now, we've last heard of trees in the garden, but remember that the word is translated in other ways. And so, what was Noah to build? An ark. That word's a hyperlink in and of itself. Of what is the ark made? Wood. Eights. Technically, eights of gopher. Gopher wood, we would say. And so, this, you know, because it's English, it's not quite as easy to spot. That's it. Now I want you to think ahead to Moses, because he's also placed in an ark, which is placed in the water. He's also a deliverer who furthers the plan of God. And in their, and in their world, all those plagues are deconstruction and chaos. And then God brings them out of that. That's why they cross through the sea. They're coming out of the water. They're coming out of chaos as a new creation. All of that was stuck in their mind. That's another hyperlink. As Noah was drawn out, excuse me, Moses is drawn out of the water as Noah. New Testament, Jesus at his baptism comes up out of the water. And there's your deliverer, and there's another pattern in a hyperlink. The Ark of the Covenant Ark is also made out of eights. That's the way you're meant to read your Bible. You're supposed to spot it. We are supposed to spot all that. So, once again, let's back up a little bit. Why did God bring the flood? To judge the violence and the raw on the earth. All of that started with the second tree because God saw that the hearts of mankind was perpetually raw. And that word in and of itself is a hyperlink back to the second tree. But this judgment is so extreme that after it happens, God says He won't do it again. But we're going to read something that if we're paying attention is a little strange. So God says, this is bad, this is bad, and I had to give the planet the ultimate, well, cleansing. But still and yet, God, God still wants to rule with humans in His creation because that dominion mandate is still in effect. So he works with and through Noah. What does Noah have to do? He has to gather eights. He has to cut down some eights. He has to build a boat out of eights or trees. Remember the imagery. Where does the ark made of eights land? On a mountain or a high place. How does that link to Eden? That's a garden. Well, elsewhere it's called the mountain of God. Why? Because gardens and mountains are equated with the abode of God. So, follow the imagery here. We've got trees, eights, land on a mountain or a high place. What's the name of the mountain, or more properly, the mountain range in which the ark lands? We call it Ararat. And then Hebrew, that word shares the same consonantal structure with the word for cursed, and they actually rhyme in Hebrew. Another thing you're not going to get in the English. But what does, then does Noah, now you can f look in your Bible. What does Noah do on top of the mountain? Genesis 8.20 says that Noah built an altar to the Lord. And, took, and there's a lot of weird stuff in here. We tend to just read over it. But Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again, now listen to this, pay attention. I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So, upon his exit from the ark, built of eights, Noah built an altar. And this is not the first sacrifice of which we read, but it's the first time we see the word altar. Okay? So we have a high place. He knows to get out of the ark at this time because the dove has brought back an olive branch. Eights. So he knows now the planet's fit for you know, living on again. So we have a high place. We have the flora, the trees, or the eights. We have an altar. 
We were coming out of the waters of chaos, so we have a new creation. And then he had to build a fire on the altar, and they don't have those fake logs or gas fire. He has to build it out of eights. Now whether he chopped down an eights or he pulled some planks off the ark, I don't know. Doesn't really matter. Either way, he had to use eights or trees. What does a sacrifice represent? Represent. It represents communion with God. And at the same time, you're getting a new covenant. See, this is a do-over. This is a starting over. Look at Genesis 9.1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, does this sound familiar? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Same thing God told Adam. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. So he's now covered all the categories of animals that were created in the creation story. Into your hand they are delivered. That's dominion. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood, and for your life and for your life blood i will require a reckoning from every beast i will require it and from man from his fellow man i will require a reckoning for the life of man so i want you to see some some similarities here be fruitful and multiply i've already spoiled that one for you where do you hear that in eden with adam why are you hearing it because this is this is 2.0 this is a do over be fruitful Trees have fruit. We talked about that in the Bible. Humans have fruit also. Their seed, their lineage. Look at the stipulations on the food. You are free to eat of all this, but... What, is, what were they told in the garden? You can eat of any tree, but... You see, we read over this and we don't see it. We're meant to see this. Just, just go, ooh, ooh. Horshack, you know, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, this is meant to be a light bulb coming on to see what God is really doing here. We get hung up on how deep was the water, how big was the boat, how did you get all the, you know. doesn't matter. It doesn't stinking matter. That's not the point. The point is, this is a new creation, a new Adam, a new covenant here. Remember, um, You've got the violent spilling of blood as one of the main reasons for the judgment in the first place. I'll go back to Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the raw of man was great in the Eretz and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, why did God say, we just read it, He's bringing the judgment of the flood because man's heart and the intent is evil continually. And then God says, after this massive thing, this massive judgment, I'm not going to do that again. Why? Look at verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in His heart, I'll never again curse the ground because of man. Why? For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Y'all see what I'm saying? The reason He brought the flood or the reason he's not going to bring another flood is the same reason he brought the flood in the first place. Now that, that should kind of take us aback for a minute. He didn't come up with a new reason. The reason this won't happen again is the very reason that it happened in the first place. Because the rationale, once again, for the flood is the same reason there. If, if God were to bring... Think about this. It makes sense. If God were to bring a flood of such proportions, every time humanity got in this position, it would never stop raining. Right now, we'd, be, we'd all be treading water. It would be a constant one a constant massive judgment of biblical proportions one right after the other. And so God knows that mankind's going to continue to pollute the earth with violence and the spilling of blood and all that leads to that or comes from that, that death. So, we're meant to see something here. You've got this, I'm not, I'm judging, I'm flooding because of this and then you've got an event and then you've got, I'll never do it again for the same reason. 
What is the difference there between the first pronouncement of judgment and the second pronouncement that will never happen again? The answer is the sacrifice. Have you noticed that it, he, he's even, you should notice, even when they're loading the ark, there are clean animals and unclean animals. You don't get that other than this. You don't get that language until you get to Leviticus. There could be a couple different reasons for that. I'm not going to go into that now. But we, we won't see that sort of thing until you get to Leviticus. Do you see how the sacrifice is described as a pleasing aroma unto the Lord? You, don't, you get that from Leviticus with the sacrifices. It's the same phrasing used there. Noah is performing the same duties of, of a priest. You don't get that language until you get into Leviticus where all that's codified. This is something new in this instance to this degree. Noah's getting off the eights in the midst of eights on a high place, building an offer, offering us building an altar, offering a sacrifice with a new covenant, and he's ask, act, acting the way a priest should. And he's given the same dominion mandate that Adam and Eve were given. This is a big deal. Eden 2.0. And then it says, all this happens because now he has provided rest, relief, same basic concept, from the curse and the raw through the sacrifice. Rest has been restored, at least for a time. Because Why? Because it's going to go south again. All right? And so things right now are like they were as they were instituted in Eden. We'll see it again in the Ten Commandments. So this is really groovy stuff. Take in all the hyperlinks. This is the way you're meant to read your Bibles. And then the story adds another layer of significance to the tree because you have the sacrifice on the high place with the tree. And then Noah goes down and what does he do? He plants a vineyard. Eats. And of course we know he partakes of the fruit of the vine. Way too much. And then you have a, I'm not going into all the details, you have a moral failure and you have nakedness, naked, naked, I don't know y'all say naked, but where I'm from is naked and there's a difference between being naked and naked. I won't define that here. Talk to me afterwards. But you have nakedness, nakedness, moral failure, which mirrors the nakedness and the moral failure that you see in the garden. And then Noah is disqualified, in a sense, for his mission. And though from there, things go from bad to worse as we move, move toward the Tower of Babel, which brought about another judgment, but it's not a flood, it's a scattering. It's a harem, it's an exile. And then, after that, you're kind of at the end of chapter 11, and this is like major, this is like Lord of the Rings stuff. And then all of a sudden... You kind of you hear a little something, there's a little bitty genealogy for a few lines, and all of a sudden, boom, we're introduced to another character, Abram. I'll call him Abraham, but Abram. So we move on in the biblical story. Turn to Genesis 12, please, in your Bible. And it's said in 12 is real, where you really start getting Abraham. Genesis 1 through 11 are set up for all of this. If you've taken the narrative class, you know what set up is. 1 through 11 is just a setup for why you, need, why you need Abraham. But Abraham is there because you needed Noah, and Noah failed, and then you needed Noah because Adam failed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, so he's obedient, and, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. So he's a wealthy man. He's got servants. That's what that means. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan, or Canaan is the way they say it. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the tree, oak, eights, of Moray. Moray is one letter off and rhymes in Hebrew with Moriah. Mount Moriah, you know where that is? It's where we call the Temple Mount, Jerusalem. Now, you don't think ahead of me now, but that's where we'll be headed. So, Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, Hebrew word is seed. 
to your seed, I will give this land. So he built there and what? An altar to the Lord. What do you put on an altar to start the fire? You got to put eights. And he's at an eights. Okay? If nothing else, you will know what the Hebrew word for tree is by the end of this. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the hill country, high places, on the east of Bethel, or Bethel, which means house of God, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And what did he do? He, there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev, which is the desert in the south. So, we've talked about the offspring or the seed. I'm going to give you this land. That's a covenant. It's a covenant that tells you right away this is a big deal. And, and most of us raised in church, you kind of know that. I'm trying to paint all the, the weavings that goes into it because once you get later in the Bible, this should not slip up on you. You should be riding a, a tsunami wave into the New Testament with all the imagery that's coming. So we see that he arrives in Shechem at the eights of Mamre. Mamre means vision. The tree or the eights of vision is where he is. And then what's he do? He's at the place at the tree of vision and then God talks to him. You're, that's meant to jump off the page at us. So Abraham's in the next main character through whom, through whom God is working. The next Adam, figuratively speaking. Abraham comes on the scene in chapter 12, once again with chapters 1 through 11 being the setup and all that follows. And what does Abraham do after arriving in Shechem at the eights? He builds an altar. Shechem is on a mountain, Mount Gerizim. So he's building an altar. He's got eights. He's at eights on a high place, on a mountain. Where does Jesus take the disciples? Some of them. To drop a bomb on them. To the mount. Where does Jesus give His bombshell sermon? On the mount. Sermon on the mount. It doesn't have to be 18,000 feet high. It just has to be a high place. Where do the pagans worship? At high places. Bamot. All right? They worship at Bamot. Or once again, the singular is Bama, B-A-M-A. -A. Prophetic, pagan, right? no. I'll hear about that one. But, uh, and what do they do? They worship in groves, either real trees or poles they've cut that represent eights. They're made of eights, but they're representative of this very thing. This is just, this is just works its way all through. So he builds an altar on Mount Gerizim, which is where Shechem is. It's the high place. So we have, once again, we have an eight on a high place with an altar, a place of sacrifice. And God appears to Abraham here at the tree of vision. That is supposed to jump out at us, if we know to look for it. Otherwise, we're just reading a story and then hurry up and get to the punchline. But this is building the whole way. Look at Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So God tells him here that he's going to be make of him a great nation, which is a blessing of multiplication, which is akin to what God told Adam and Noah, be fruitful and multiply. And once again, what does it mean when you have a lot of children? One, it means... It, it's, it's the very basics, some sense of wealth, but at the same and prosperity, but all and blessing, but also you keep you live on. He's going to be. He's not going to just have a bunch of kids and grandkids and great grandkids like we do. He's going to be a nation. They're going to have status. And then, if to jump tr tracks for a minute, what does God call that nation? His firstborn. And we talked about what that means. That does not mean chronologically first, because Israel wasn't first. That's a place of status. And we've seen how God continually takes the second, third, fourth, fifth born and elevates them to the status of the firstborn. And then when you get to the New Testament and Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, to whom is He speaking? The dregs of humanity. And what does He tell them? You will be elevated. That's how you're meant to read your Bible. So, this he has this blessing of multiplication, 
like Adam and Noah. And then Abraham has a massive fail because right after this we read he goes down to Egypt during a famine. And he lies to Pharaoh. And he brings a curse on, on Pharaoh and the nation when he's actually supposed to be a blessing, not a curse. He's already failed. You, you track Abraham's life. He has ten monumental tests. And I don't remember. I think he fails like seven of them. And this is the first one. He fails. But God still uses him. Why? He's got to. Why? He can't flood everything again. He's already scattered every, everybody. And he started over. He can't, you know, because he knows the way our hearts are. But God, So then God steps in to fix things and tells them, get back in the land. And from here, you see that going, going down to Egypt is never a good thing. Leaving the land is never a good thing. So God, once again, has to step in and fix it, or His plan will never get across the goal line. He's going to have to step in. Even if we all did what we're supposed to, He's still going to have to step in to carry the ball across the goal line. But here we have is Abraham is the next seed in that thread of the firstborn. He's the next main character in the line. He then goes to a mountain. Goes back where he came from. He goes back to a mountain between Ai and Bethel and returned to the altar that he'd previously built. He eventually then goes to Hebron where he settles among the trees, the eights of Mamre, and Hebron is on a mountain. So he's back in a high place with trees. And God's moving there. You then have the story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael. We're, most of us are familiar with that. Abraham, uh, you know, he, I talked about that. We're old, we're not, you know, he said, look, Lord, you promised me a son. All I got is my servant, and legally he can inherit. But, you know, I'm an old man, She's not a spring chicken either. you got to show me the money. And God says, I'll do that. But then there's a delay. And so what do they do? Sarah, here's my handmaid. And that to us, that is just sickening, and I don't recommend doing it. But in their culture, in that part of the world, that's surrogacy. That's the way it was done. Then, then Hagar legally becomes a wife and has a, supposed to have all the protections of a wife. Ishmael becomes the son and he is then legally able to inherit whatever um, his father leaves him. The land, the business, that sort of thing. And then he is supposed to take care of his mother. All right. Well, we've read the story. We know that things got dramatic in the house. Two ladies, the cat, this caddy, that's in, and Sarah's like, yeah, she's got to go. And Abraham is a typical guy. I'm not getting in the middle of this. Whatever you want to do, honey. Sends them out. They're sent back. But then they are sent away again. But you see, the surrogacy is just like going to the second tree because they're circumventing the plan. And there's no faith there. We know we're promised a son. God hasn't given us one. We'll, we'll do it on our own. So it's back to the old saying I've told you before that Daddy used to use, let's do something even if it's wrong. Well, that was wrong. So we have all that drama. And then if you follow that story, uh, you, what you have then is Abraham is very willing to part with the boy. He's willing to get rid of the son. That's important. Because he does eventually have a son, Isaac. And then what does God tell him to do? Get rid of him. It's counterintuitive been waiting on him. Get rid of him. He's already been willing to get rid of the other one. Will he be willing to get rid of the, the Isaac? That's supposed to be going on in our heads, all right, if we're reading this. So, turn to Genesis 22, please. So this is the tenth test or trial of Abraham when he's told to take Isaac for the sacrifice. All right, so Genesis 22, 1, we got a rock and roll here. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, which is one letter off of Moriah that we talked about earlier. They rhyme. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the, what? All right, so you got a mountain. You have to build an altar. 
Because there's a sacrifice on an altar on a high place. Start you know, kidneys, man. We're figuring this out. Okay. So he's going to, to, going to, 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 told to go to the mountain. Verse 2. He said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men, servants, with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the the eights, the wood, the tree, same thing, for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him, which once again is Moriah. On the third day, that should pop up, all right, all through, okay. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now, for those of you from Mississippi, that doesn't mean there was a fire burning. That's the way you say it, where I'm from. And those towers that you have that observe fire, those are fire towers. Seriously. So if y'all travel, you break down through Mississippi, you go, what's that? And they go, fire tower, you'll know. A fire tower. Okay. So on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. That's the same place. That's how you know the wise men. They were all farmen. They said they came from afar. But Okay. So then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the eights, there you go, of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. On his back. So he's carrying the tree on his back. Mm hmm. Y'all starting to figure this out, ain't you? All right. See, I might, we've got to stop the series now. Y'all already got the punchline. And he, in, uh, let's see, he took the wood and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Because that's the way. Dads and sons talk to each other. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. I'm not sure how far up that hill that pacifies me if I'm thinking ahead. Okay. You sure? You know, but anyway, and I, I doubt Isaac was thinking that way because he doesn't know. He wasn't privy to the conversation between God. So verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the eights in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar. So now you got him on the tree instead of the tree on him. On top of the eights, then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord, and most we believe that to be God himself, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold... Behind him was a ram caught in a... Uh -huh. That's it. Y'all got this, man. I can go sit down. Somebody else can teach it now. And a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram. And some of that's been kind of ob somewhat obvious, but the way this is usually used as a type, I think, is wrong because it doesn't... The analogy breaks down unless you go this deep. Is what I, I'm just going to leave it at that. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So then you move along in time, you got the day of atonement happens on this same basic spot. You have a sacrifice. It's a goat. And all the sins of the nation for the year are put on that goat symbolically. And then he's, they send him off east and he can't come back. He is being haremed. He's being sent away from the presence out of the city. As he leaves, it's supposed to cleanse everything or the city is cleansed through that. Now it got so, that, you know, sometimes the, the animal would turn around and come back. You can't have that. No, go, shoo. 
So it got to be that eventually they would almost escort him to a cliff or way out where, you know, where you know he can't get back. That's how they're called. If you know anything about goats and sheep, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed. All right. So, but in this whole passage, as I kind of mentioned, um, eights is used numerous times. And if you're reading it, if just like we pay, you see tree, wood, if that's all the same word, you keep hitting it. Even if you're reading English, it just starts to jump off the page. So Abraham cuts down some eights. He then lays the eights on Isaac so he can carry the eights on his back to the high place, the place of sacrifice where Abraham is going to build an altar. Same thing we keep seeing from Eden through Noah to here. And Abraham is going through with things when the angel angel of the Lord stops him. And then we see that a ram is provided, a male lamb, is provided as a sacrifice. Where is the ram? It's stuck in an eights. And so here we have two eights. Eight seam? I'd have to figure that one out. Here we have two trees, two eightses. We'll go that. We'll go with that. You got the pile upon which Isaac was laying, and the one that provided the sacrifice. Two trees. We're now back to Eden. And at least in that sense. Once again, two. And then the angel of the Lord then blesses Abraham. Look at twenty two fifteen. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. And if you want something to really keep you awake at night, go back to the, the analogy of, hey, of Ishmael, how he's willing to part. And that seen as bad, now willing to part is seen as good. Yet the second time Ishmael has to leave, God says it's okay, so it's okay to part. Jewish meditation literature is meant to keep you up at night, okay? So just go play with that one. All right. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And that is deeper. If you understand what the phrase sons of God means, that's deeper than just a lot of numbers there or big numbers as the sand of the seashore, and your offspring, your seed, shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed, or offspring, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. So in the story, we see that there's one tree that's cut down. The improper sacrifice. The wrong one. That's the represents the tree of Tov and Ra. The other tree act provides the real sacrifice. So as in the garden, we talked about this last week. As in the garden, Abraham had to pass by the tree of Tov and Ra. God didn't hide the bad tree in a corner somewhere with a bunch of bushes in front of it. It's right there next to the good tree. You have to pass by or be in proximity to the bad to get the good. It's meant to be that way. You're meant to have to make a choice. And so in this imagery here, you've got the tree that produces the sacrifice, the thicket, the bush, the eights. And then you have the eights upon which Abraham, I'm mean, excuse me, Isaac was lying. And so they're right there together, but through his obedience and faith, Abraham essentially unwittingly dismantles the bad tree. You see, it's the faith and the obedience that does away with the bad tree, the Tov and Ra. That's the principle we got to live with. Faith and obedience. If you want to do away with the Tov and Ra in the world as an imager of God, then you live in faith and obedience. And you image that to others. And as it grows, one soul at a time, as sacred space is retaken, because every believer is a temple, and every temple is a holy place on holy ground, you're taking back sacred space. And that's how you take back the planet. Not through war, not through your politics. Vote and vote for, well, I'll say vote for good folks, but I don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter what party, I don't know who you vote for at that point. Do the best you can. Like me, it's the lesser of two evils. That's what, that's what I'm looking at. But in order to receive the blessing, like we talked about last week, 
Through his obedience and faith, Abraham unwittingly dismantles the tree of Tov and Ra. So from the get beginning and through this thread, we see that through faith and obedience, we inherit eternal life. That's in their mind. That's something when, he, when he, his seed becomes a nation, he lives on forever. It's like a tree. It keeps dropping seeds. It keeps going. This tree eventually croaks, but you've got a bunch of little trees that keep growing and having seeds. That is their world. And that's one way. It's an image. It's a type of the eternal life. But it comes, that blessing comes on the heels of the faith and obedience to the tree of life. So Abraham was promised that his seed is going to be multiplied and his seed be a great nation. Abraham lives on through that nation. That's why we're sitting there talking about him today. And his, that nation that his seed imagery became. Once again, a type or image of eternal life. Last week we saw how we can be like a tree of life to people because people are likened to trees. The believer is likened to a tree, a tree of life even, who is rooted or stands next to what? The water. Why the water? Because that's sustenance from God. I will make you, I will give you rivers of life coming out of you. All of that connects. And so we see that we can be likened to trees. I showed that last week. Uh, and so we can be likened to a, the tree of life, or we can be likened to a tree of Tov and Ra. Depends on what kind of image, what kind of reflecting we're doing there. Because we as believers are tasked with being the tree of life to those around us, and we do that, as I've just said, by being images of God, living out the character of God, and providing to others the character and mercy God has shown us. But in life... As we've seen, we've got to, we must often pass by the other tree in order to get to that tree. Because the tree's still there. We've got to dismantle it. How do you do that? Faith and obedience. So all of this stuff that we're talking about is a tree or image of eternal life. And we can only have that eternal life through the faith, Old Testament par, you know, parlance, believing loyalty of the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus. So all of this stuff you've been dry, you've been been drinking out of a fire hose, but y'all are kind of catching on to it. You know, I've, I've heard that. So the application is there. So why don't we do what so many others have not done and take God up on His offer? 